want to talk about Narendra Modi and the BJP. I thought we'll do this at the end of the the episode. Um there's a lot of narratives that go out in the west about India being a you know sort of a very skewed nation that we're on the verge of dictatorship that we're uh, on the verge of self destruction i have a bunch of friends who are deeply uh, inspired by left wing ideologies i have lots of friends who are deeply inspired by right wing ideologies uh, i'd love to know your kind of relay of information to the west in terms of if you had to introduce narendra modi from both a national standpoint and a geopolitical standpoint what changes have you observed in the country you're also someone who doesn't follow national politics just like myself but we do follow what the government is up to especially from an international perspective the truth of the matter is that you could debate a lot about what this indian government could do better on a national level no one at all can argue that there is a better international representative of india than this government because this government knows how to show its teeth and they know how to make money i'm saying these things because we just spoke about geopolitical power power is about money power is about control there are theories that say that maybe democracy isn't even the way to go <laughs> you know maybe it's not the right way to run a nation what do you have to say about this whole dictatorship angle uh the fascism accusations what do you have to say about modi on an international level and what do you have to say about this projection when we're talking about 2032 2033 as an important phase i think every single indian no matter what their political ideologies are they know that this government is going to stay in power for 10 years because what brings a government into national power in india are the votes of rural india and i've often seen that most left wing ideologies are only in urban centers in india you go out in the interiors you'll barely find anyone who's like out and out left wing at least the majority uh will vote for the current government and they have they have a very different outlook on the current government my point is i've traveled all over india and i'm very very sure that this government is going to stay in power until that 2032 33 mark at least if not beyond so abhijit chavda sir how would you like to introduce this government or talk about this government to international audiences so this current government came to power in 2014 hmm. and india had just gone through a decade of stagnation the previous regime the congress regime came to power in 2004 when mr atal bihari bajpay and his nda uh, coalition lost the election and then there was a period of high growth because of the policies that the nda had implemented because typically in national economics you see results a few years after you implement policies so the first 5 years of the uh, of the upa rule was good i mean the, the nation did well and then the economy took a downturn it went into the doldrums and there were all these uh, scams and god knows what so the nation was sick and tired of that that's the uh, that's the mood that one sensed and then mr modi was projected as the he was put as the next prime ministerial candidate and he had a very strong tra- track record of turning around the state of gujarat from one of the backwaters of india into the most uh, rapid the most rapidly developing state in the country essentially and people voted for him it was a popular vote and he came to power with a big majority a uh, uh, a decisive majority he did not need the help of coalition partners to form the government right and clearly his policies were good in the first term and that's why he was reelected with an even bigger majority majority in the in the second term so the policies that he has implemented have been very uh, nation centric national interest oriented and the foreign policy as well so he has focused on the economy he has focused on the military it's taken time it's taken time to get things going because it's a massive nation 1.3 billion people huge inertia you want to implement policies it's going to take several years for the results to start becoming visible how many years realistically at least 5 years okay at least 5 years you you implement a new policy you put a new policy forth you order the bureaucrats to start implementing it they're going to take their own time india's bureaucracy is a legacy of the colonial era it's not the most agile bureaucracy in the world and so on so there are all these issues and now we are seeing the results of that you also had the coronavirus down the the entire uh, recession because of that two years we mm. lost two years but now the economy is doing well so overall if you look at look at mr modi he is an extremely popular leader india is a vibrant democracy people uh, make these accusations of fascism fascism uh, against uh, the bjp and mr modi 
when you talk about fascism, you're talking about Mussolini, we're talking about people like Hitler, right? They put people in concentration camps. They massacred lots of people. How many people have been massacred in India or put in concentration camps? Zero. Right. So th- that accusation is is just to tarnish the image and paint somebody with the with a certain kind of brush. Mr. Modi is clearly an extremely popular leader. And when you talk about democracy, the people say that India is teetering on the on the brink of dictatorship. India is the most vibrant democracy in the world. Can, let's compare India with the United States. The United States is a two party nation. There's two par- it's, it's a two-party state. It is just one step ahead of communist China, which is a one-party state. It's just one step ahead of North Korea, which is a one-party state. The US only has two political parties. Who's going to represent the Native Americans? Who's going to represent the Hispanics? Who's going to represent the African Americans? Who's going to represent the various minorities that are marginalized in the US. Mm. In India, we have political parties that represent every single faction of society. In the US, everything is force-fitted into this two-party framework. It is artificial. I do not consider this to be democracy. If you want to consider any nation undemocratic or dictatorial, it's actually the US, not India. Mm. India is a very vibrant democracy. Yes, it's chaotic. Yes, there are issues. But it's a far better democracy. It's far better representative of the people and their aspirations, especially all the small minorities, than anything the the Americans can show us. So these accusations of India teetering on the brink of dictatorship, they are risible, laughable, ridiculous. Right? So... So that's the thing. Now, which which uh, system is good? Is is dictatorship good? Is democracy good? Well, I would say that any system is good as long as it produces results, right? As long as it serves the people and serves the nation in the long term, any system is good. For the longest time in the world, we had monarchies, we had emperors queens, kings, emperors, and they did a good job. It's only in the past uh, 70, 80, 100 years that we have have, have been experimenting with democracy. And we still have to see how far that experiment succeeds. India had, India is the birthplace of democracy. We had the Mahajanapadas, these self-governing people's republics that go back to the Mahabharat era, Mm. which is several thousand years before today. Democracy wasn't born in Greece. Democracy was born in India. We had our own form of democracy, which would have elected kings or queens. And they could be deposed if they did not perform. Mm. Right? So we don't need to be lectured about democracy. We don't need need anyone to teach us what democracy is. Now, is democracy the right thing for India? I think we are a democratic nation. It's, it's It's in our DNA. Right? But maybe this form of democracy may not be the ideal form of democracy. Maybe in the future we will tweak things and uh, embrace a different form of democracy, but it will still be democracy. Hmm. Now, in the 21st centuries, the nations that will rule the world are the nations that will implement policies and and adjust to the changing environment rapidly. The ones that react the fastest and implement policies the fastest in the shortest time, these are the nations that will rule the world. Can you give an example of the situation? Like what kind of policy will have to be implemented because of something happening on an international scale? Right. Let's say there's a global recession Hmm. and your economy is suffering because of that. Now, let's say you have to change policies. Maybe you need to change the way your 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 banking system works, or maybe you need to change the way the interest rates are, or or any economic change. If you take several months to implement a certain change, it may be too late to save your economy. But if you can do it immediately with one order and it's done tomorrow, that's gonna turn the ship around very fast. Is Modi the most powerful prime minister our country has seen? Possibly. In history. Uh Maybe not the most powerful because today's geopolitical scenario is that there is a lot of interference within India from external sources. What happened in in the early 1990s, the 1992, I think the the, uh, economic liberalization, it came with a whole bunch of caveats. So India had nearly gone bankrupt. We had less than a week's foreign reserves left, maybe three or four days uh, foreign exchange reserves left. So we had to take loans from the IMF and the World Bank. Now, when you take loans from the IMF and the World Bank, they're going to take a piece of your soul for that in exchange. You have to to give more than your pound of flesh. So they will tell you, they will give the money, but they will tell you exactly how to use it. 
you cannot use it for whatever you think is right they will tell you how to use it first of all you have to open up your economy you have to allow their companies to start investing in in your economy and all kinds of things happen and that's how your country gets penetrated by the various tendrils and roots that come from the west from the deep state essentially and so on which is america which is america so when you're taking a loan from uh, the imf the world bank you're actually taking a loan from big daddy usa that's what it is and that's when india slowly became compromised from within mm. there are various political parties that do enjoy patronage from other countries they used to uh, enjoy patronage from the ussr the ussr dissolved it broke up in the early 90s then they were looking for a new big daddy i'm not naming anybody but you know it it would have happened so then they found this new big daddy in the us and the us is is uh, well known for for spreading democracy across the world in a variety of ways sometimes they bomb democracy into a country with uh, with bombs sometimes they infiltrate democracy into your country in a variety of means and what they mean by democracy is is you do what they tell you to do mm. and you run your country the way they think is right depending on their whims and fancies so india at that time became compromised and and since it has been more and more compromised so right now there is a huge amount of external interference within india subnational diplomacy and what not what does that mean it means that they will ind- the americans will engage with politicians in india not at the central level but at state level and even smaller than that and that is essentially you know trying to compromise your country and, and you know try create factions within the nation and all that like it's a modern version of divide and rule it's divide and rule it's it's the 21st century of divide and rule that's mm-hmm. what it is so they've learned from the from the uk the us empire is is the anglo saxon empire the capital shifted from 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 london to washington dc but it's the same entity essentially mm-hmm. right so that's what they're doing so mr modi has to contend with these issues india is compromised india has lots of you know general bp bipin rawat spoke about a 2.5 2.5 front war that if india has to go to war with china pakistan will also get involved and there's going to be a, 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 a one more front within india mm. so one is china one is pakistan and half is within india wow yeah so 2.5 front war so that's what he meant by the internal problems in india which have been created by outside forces and there's a whole bunch of issues within that so that's why mr modi is has to contend with those things when it comes to when it came to somebody like mrs indira gandhi she did not have that much of problems within india so she was able to be more decisive she was able to bifurcate pakistan and and free bangladesh for instance yeah so she was able to uh, pursue a more muscular foreign policy i'm not saying mr modi is not pursuing a muscular foreign policy but mr modi is playing the long game uh he is playing the game i think that deng shopping had advocated hide and bide hide your capabilities and bide your time and work hard and strengthen yourself so maybe that is the right thing for india to do right now and get richer get richer that's the whole deal get richer so that's what india is doing right now thank you for watching this clip if you want to learn more about this topic we've curated a playlist just for you and here's a link to the whole episode